so many people say, well, it's just so hard. My diet, changing my diet is just so hard. It's not fair. Poor me. You know, everybody else can eat it. No, they can't. Not really. I mean, it's estimated that 40% of the U.S. population has gluten sensitivity. That's a pretty big, overwhelming quantity of individuals. And when you take into consideration the fact that one in seven in America, in the U.S., has a form of autoimmune disease already, that means you're in a room full of seven people. There's one of them there with an autoimmune disease. And you take into consideration that autoimmune disease is the number one killer in females under the age of 65. Then changing your diet is pretty easy compared to living with all the symptoms, problems of autoimmune disease and then the drugs and the consequences of all those drugs downstream from it. So diet change, in my opinion, is a relative easy change when you consider the alternative. All right, so as promised, I told you we'd get to, you know, the nutritional deficiencies that can lead to chronic pain. So I want to talk about some of those. Um, so, so this is not intended to be a comprehensive list, but what I wanted to do was give you some really major players because these major players, I've seen it in the clinic, have some of the greatest degrees of impact on individuals. So vitamin C, I've actually seen cases where Vitamin C all by itself reduced pain in individuals. Um, and that's just because individuals were deficient in vitamin C, and vitamin C is a very potent anti-inflammatory, and vitamin C is necessary to heal. And so some people have what's called subclinical scurvy. If you've ever heard of scurvy, it's the name of the disease state associated with vitamin C deficiency. Some people have subclinical scurvy, and subclinical scurvy can manifest as pain. And so this is one nutrient. It's very safe to take even at very high doses because your body won't let you take more than what it can handle because you'll have diarrhea before you have any kind of toxicity. So it's vitamin C is a bowel tolerance. So you take it to bowel tolerance. And for many people is an answer to, to their struggle. Vitamin B12 is one. Now B12 is where I see vitamin B12 play a major role is in people that have nerve pain. So there'll be individuals, for example, that have diseases like multiple sclerosis or transverse myelitis um, that are diseases where the myelin sheath around the nerve is starting to deteriorate and you need vitamin B12 to make the myelin. So you, without B12, you cannot produce the myelin sheath. And so sometimes the pain is as a result of not having adequate myelin. So um, B12, very important in that regard. And so if we're looking at quantities, if you're talking about quantities, well, well, with vitamin B12, you know, my favorite style of B12, you will, or form is, is methyl cobalamin. It's the form the body prefers for most people. Methyl cobalamin. Uh, it's an activated form of vitamin B12. And, and so... If you suspect a vitamin B12 deficiency, you know, start somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 mcg micrograms is what that is, micrograms per day. Um, that's kind of a starting place. Now, it's always best to have your doctor check your levels, not in your blood, but inside your cell, so your intracellular vitamin B12, because the blood can be quite misleading. The blood levels of vitamin B12. Another one that's very effective in my experience is vitamin B5, otherwise known as pantothenic acid. Now, this can be effective. I've seen it be effective for nerve and for joint issues. Um, vitamin B5 is necessary to support cortisol regulation. So remember I was talking about cortisol earlier and how too much cortisol can create problems, not enough cortisol can create problems. Well, one of B5's functions is in the regulation of cortisol. Same thing with vitamin C. These two actually play together to help with supporting that normalization of cortisol. And we have things like vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 and a lot of research studies show that vitamin B6 is actually very beneficial in people with autoimmune pain. Uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, vitamin B6 is necessary to metabolize certain chemicals that can lead to pain. I, I talked a few weeks ago about glyphosate, or not glyphosate, I'm sorry, oxalate, and said that you need vitamin B6 to metabolize oxalate. And sometimes the reason people on a high grain diet have pain is because they're over consuming foods that are high in oxalate 
and oxalate crystals can actually lodge in the joint, creating like a pseudo gout or a pseudo arthritis. And you need vitamin B6 to break that oxalate down and to get it out of the body. So B6 can be helpful in that regard. But there's also a chemical called homocysteine that B12 and B6 both help to regulate. And homocysteine elevations can also contribute to nerve pain. You also need vitamin B6 to produce some of the neurochemicals. So for example, you can't make dopamine. Dopamine is one of those molecules in your body that helps you regulate perception of pain. And so low levels of dopamine will make a person more, more um, susceptible to pain when they do come across it. So dopamine, very important neurotransmitter for the regulation of pain perception. And then we have vitamin D. Well, there's a lot of research on vitamin D actually reducing pain and reducing inflammation in autoimmune disease, especially your arthritis, so like rheumatoid arthritis, right? So a lot of research on vitamin D being very effective. This is a real easy test to ask your doctor to measure. Ask your doctor to measure what's called your 25-OH-D. And if your level is less than 50, my advice would be talk to your doctor about supplementation. So therapeutically, a kind of a, a strong therapeutic dose of vitamin D is anywhere between 8,000 and 10,000 IU a day. Some doctors or some uh, will tell you that it's a dangerous vitamin because it's fat soluble. I would simply say I've never yet seen the case of vitamin D toxicity in 20 years of practice using high levels of this. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that you should just run out and take as much as you want. You should always look back to having your levels tested and not just take it indiscriminately. The best way to, to not need vitamin D is to get your autoimmune inflammation under control by changing your diet. Then you don't need as much vitamin D because when you don't have autoimmunity, you don't, your body doesn't need to burn through all that vitamin D as much. So you're not as prone to developing deficiency in the natural sunlight is, and then foods like mushroom and liver can take on the job of providing that that for you. Quercetin, and this was one of my favorite. I love quercetin. And the reason why is quercetin has this, it acts on the same place biochemically as steroids. So when doctors give corticosteroids for pain, you know, quercetin works on the same chemical. Vitamin C and quercetin, when given together, have a synergistic effect on the same chemical process that, that steroids affect. So I love quercetin, one to two grams a day can be extremely effective. And I've seen people, uh, you know, use quercetin and vitamin C, you know, and, and again, key here is under supervision. You don't want to do this without your doctor's supervision using vitamin C and quercetin together to be able to wean off of their steroids and stay stable and still have good function. And then we have minerals like calcium and zinc and magnesium. I love, these are the three big ones, although not the only three, but these two particularly, calcium and magnesium, I like to call them the lost electrolytes. They, they generally aren't added to electrolyte formulas, but a lot of people don't realize that magnesium and, and calcium regulate neurological function. And I see all the time people with chronic nerve pain as a result of calcium magnesium deficiency. I also see people are taking drugs like calcium channel blockers and, and diuretics that deplete these two nutrients, end up in a lot of pain, having a lot of acute muscle spasms. So they have a lot of muscle cramps, muscle spasms and nerve pain as a result of depleted levels of calcium and magnesium. And then zinc as well. Zinc plays a major, major role as an antioxidant. And uh, in one of its functions as an antioxidant, is to help uh, quench or, or, or stop aggressive free radical formation that damages your DNA. So it helps your body do something very well, and that's heal and repair. Zinc is critical for the healing and repair and kind of the, um, if you, so inflammation is normal. A lot of people demonize inflammation just as a general word. They say, oh, inflammation is bad. But the reality is, is inflammation is what your body uses to break down old tissue so that it can repair and build new tissue. And so you want a healthy level of inflammation and zinc is what regulates the healing and repair around healthy inflammation. So you definitely want to make sure you have adequate zinc. And then omega-3, this is actually one of the things when I was in the VA hospital in the rheumatology department, this is one of the things that I found um, 
in the research originally was that omega-3 was equally as effective as non steroidal anti-inflammatories according to some research studies. But the dose had to be high enough. So you really had to get upwards of four to six grams a day of omega-3 fatty acids that are concentrated EPA and DHA to have an, a, a really solid effect on inflammation. So remember, omega-3 fatty acids help regulate inflammation. Now, I talked about this a minute ago when, um, when we were talking about this right here. Remember I said that grains contain excessive omega-6? Think of omega-6 and omega-3 like, you know, the two kids on the teeter-totter. There's a balance between them. And if, you know, one kid's a fat kid and the other kid's a really skinny kid, then the skinny kid's going to be up here in the air with his legs dangling. And you don't want your omega-3 to be the skinny kid. Um, you want there to be a nice balance between the 6 and the 3. Because otherwise, what you're going to do is you're going to increase and potentiate the inflammatory process. So if we're talking about supplements, these are some of my favorites. Um, just because their biological function is so crucial to both autoimmune regulation, but also inflammation regulation. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.